Have you ever got it wrong? And how do you deal with, you know, that kind of failure? And one of the things I always tell some young technologists, uh, when you look back on your career, you're going to look back about what you got wrong and you're going to laugh yeah. at yourself. Or at least you have to be able to laugh <laughs> at yourself. With over 40 patents though, you know, like uh, uh, behind your name, which invention or discovery are you most proud of and why? The ones that I, I'm actually most excited about right now were some of the very first patents I got uh, at mm -hmm. HP. Um, and yeah. they were all around understanding how we uh, equate energy inputs to business outputs. Welcome to Cocktail and Blurbs. I'm your host, Lindwe Matladi, and today I'm speaking to an amazing man, Kek Blesnicker. He is the chief architect of HPE Labs, and, um, and his title has a lot of other amazing things I'm sure he's going to be telling us about. He has a career that has uh, stem over a couple of years, since 1989. Oh. <laughs> and um, he has over 40 patents. Can you believe that? This man is innovation personified. Thank you for joining me, Kirk. I am so excited to have you on Cocktail and Blurbs. Oh, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited for the discussion. Yeah, um, my first question for you actually is, um, Tell me about your role, and and I want to know. You know, um, you've been at HP for so many years. Like, you know, tell me how did it start? Where is the beginning, and how did it happen? Uh, so yeah, uh, it'll be uh, in September. It'll be thirty five years uh, at Hewlett Packard, and then Hewlett Packard Enterprise as the the company has evolved uh, over the three and a half decades I've been here. Uh, but, you know, uh, it all started here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, I grew up in the South Bay, uh, down uh, in Los Gatos, a little town. Just if you're heading from the Silicon Valley over the hill into the Santa Cruz to maybe go enjoy the beach, that last little town you hit before you start going uphill is my hometown of Los Gatos, California. Um, and my dad was an aerospace engineer. Uh, he had gone to University of Santa Clara and uh, had gotten his mechanical, mechanical engineering degree. And uh, when he was, when I was little, when I was, you know, three, four, five, he was uh -huh. getting his master's degree. Uh, and I remember he, so he was working all day. He'd come home. Uh, he was back at Santa Clara University doing the early bird engineering degree. So from seven to nine, he would be going to school. From nine to five, he'd be working. He'd come home, wow. uh, take a little break for dinner, play with the kids, and then he'd be back at the books and doing his homework. Mm -hmm. And I remember just leaning over his shoulder and uh, he had um, his, you know, his table of integrals. He had all of his math textbooks. He had his uh, his slide rule because this was before calculators. And I just, wow. I just loved sitting over and looking over his shoulder. So for me, that that engineering bug definitely started <laughs> with my dad. Uh, then growing up in the Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, you know, there really wasn't another place that that we wanted to work. My and it wasn't just my engineering cohort. At, I was back at my dad's alma mater, Santa Clara University. It wasn't just the engineers who wanted to work there. It was also it was everyone on the campus. It was the business team. It was the science teams, and definitely was the engineering teams. So back in the day, 1989, um, heading into senior year, um, we all had to think about careers and think about the interview process. Because back in 1989, all the interviews were in person, on campus, there was a recruiting season, and our career office used to give us points because there were a lot of people wanted to work for Hewlett Packard or Intel or AMD, all of those great Silicon yeah. Valley companies. And so they gave us 100 points and you could you could bid on interviews. And so I put zero points on a couple of small companies that were early in the process in 1989, just to make sure I could tie my tie, still fit into my high school graduation <laughs> uh, suit and talk about my accomplishments. We had, I had done a great senior project, a capstone project with uh, with three uh, very close friends and, and our project actually worked. So we had something to talk about. 
proud about that, but you want wow. to have experience. What is it like to, to talk about your work and talk about what you've been doing that's been successful? So I got those a couple mm -hmm. interviews in early just to make sure I could do that piece of it. I took my remaining points. I put five points yeah. on AMD because I was interested in their mm -hmm. microprocessor development. Uh, I put yeah. 95 points on Hewlett Packard. Uh, and oh, wow. out of 95 out of 100, 95 points out of 100 got me the last interview on the last day. I, wow. walk, <laughs> I walk into the career office. I've got my senior project under my arm. I go to the huh. back where the little interview cubicles are. I open the door to introduce myself. And there is the gentleman uh, who was going to interview me. He had his tie was loosened. His coat was thrown over the chair and he was just rubbing his temples in an obvious yeah. brain headache. Wow. Yes. I thought, why didn't I put 100 points on HP? Because that's where we all wanted to work. And it wasn't just about yes. the technology. It was about how that technology fit into the community, how it was the it was the bedrock of the Silicon Valley. It's, you know, if you go and, and come to come to Northern California, come to the Silicon Valley, go down to Addison Avenue, you'll see the plaque, the birthplace yeah. of Silicon Valley. And it's in front of the garage where Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard started their business in 1939. So made it through the interview on campus successfully, got invited to come up here to the Sierra Nevada foothills, northeast of Sacramento, California, the capital of California. HP yeah. had our Roseville site. Uh, I got invited spring break. Come out mm -hmm. and have an on-campus interview. Come and meet the team here and uh, did wow. well. Got the offer uh, that day. Went home, pretended to play uh, hard to get for about a week. They called me back. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's where I want to work. And so that's where I started my career. We called it member of technical staff, uh, which basically meant you were a brand new engineer, minted out yes. of your university, and now they were <laughs> going to teach you what it was like to be an engineer at Hewlett Packard. Uh, so that's how I started my career process. Uh, always kept doing you know, a little bit more every day. Uh, so I went from just member of technical staff to a lead design engineer, to a system architect, to uh, a hardware division architect. And my last job back in 2014, um, when I was in the business group, uh, was I was if I was the chief architect of Hewlett Packard. Um, server's global business unit, which basically meant uh -huh. if it was a computer and it had an HP yeah. logo on it, everything above uh -huh. the laptops was my technical remit, uh, which oh. meant it was it was an incredibly broad set of products. It was the smallest little business server we had uh, to run your small uh, your small um, and medium sized business all the way up to the world's most performant supercomputing fault tolerant computing that was running uh, the majority of the world's stock exchanges and and uh, and three um, G five G communications at the time. Uh, so it was a pretty broad gamut, uh, and I had you know grown up in the business units. But back in 2014, uh, seeing those things, seeing so many things that were changing, I got a mm -hmm. call from Hewlett Packard Labs, and this will get to your question about what do I do today. Yeah. <laughs> I from Hewlett Packard Labs, and our then director of Hewlett Packard Labs, and our and our global mm -hmm. chief technology officer Martin Fink, and he said, you know, those conversations we've been having about what's coming next. You know, we have the team at labs that's doing that basic research. These are teams that are looking at five, maybe even 10 years into the future, doing research in collaboration with our industry partners, with government partners, and with the global academic community. But they're out yes. there doing that research, you know. And then you think of my old job being the chief technologist of a global business unit uh, of the, you know, at the time, the one of the largest uh, IT manufacturers in the world. And we were looking at one, two, or maybe three years at the at the most. So if a mm. business is looking at one or two years, and a researchers are looking at five or ten years, there's a gap in the middle. And Please. my job, and I was offered the job, and I and I jumped at the chance. My job was to sit in that uncomfortable middle space. What is between mm. research and product development? Product development teams, they are continuously evolving, continuously improving their products. Mm -hmm. Researchers are always asking, what's next? What's that next question? They answer one question, and it leads to the next question. And that's what that's what fascinates yeah. them. But what we really need to do is to bring those two communities together to say, yeah. okay, 
research team, I know you've had, you're have you always looking for the next question, but how about we get a little more detail on how we apply the answers that, and the insight you have to practical real real world problems and mm -hmm. to our development teams in the in their product development teams. Hey, I know you're always thinking about what's coming out next quarter, maybe next year, but how about yeah. skip ahead a couple of years? What do you want to have as part of your global uh, supply chain of innovations and technologies so that you can then be prefetching what the future is like? And so that's my job on a daily basis is to sit in that uncomfortable middle space between research and product development and then bring everyone together. And it's important to note that, you wow. know, when I started back in, in 1989, I could come to come over the across the bay, come up to Palo yeah. Alto and to the Hewlett Packard Labs team, and I could teach the yeah. team doing basic uh, computer architecture research, basic semiconductor research, how manufacturing processes and above that operating system libraries, middleware, and the end, HP printers, HP displays, and HP mm -hmm. disk drives. Very vertically integrated, which meant that innovation could flow right from the labs team to our, our manufacturing teams, to our engineering design teams, and our services and support teams globally. Here in the 21st century, and we're all very grateful for this, innovation is now a global business, and yes. it is a very complicated supply chain. You know, so... yeah. Some a, a research at labs has a great idea. Okay, you have a great idea on a, a little piece of semiconductor. Well, first get TSMC or Global Foundries to to make it in their fab. Then get one of our semiconductor prop pa, uh, partners to in, incorporate it into their design. Then get an open source kernel team from the Linux uh, uh, the Linux open source community to write a driver for you. Then get a software wow. to begin to capitalize it, and and then it's ready yeah. to go out. So. So right now it's 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 so much more complicated, but it's also so much more energizing and open and have yeah. all those diverse communities again globally now participating in that innovation ecosystem. But it it makes it a little more challenging for me uh, because there's yeah. that more people that we have to convene. And of course, technology isn't just about technology; it's also about mm -hmm. policy, it's about governance, it's about understanding how we deliver technology, not just for technology's sake but to solve real problems that people have. And that means that you need to understand the problems that people have. And the problems that mm -hmm. I have here uh, in Northern California are probably different than the ones that you're facing. So how do we bring technology that solves global problems, but really looking at those local issues, how do we really bring technology that fits and is fit for purpose when that purpose is so diverse as the entire world? Yeah. Wow. Whew. I mean, I'm like <laughs> listening to you. At some point, I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to have a headache. You know, it explains why you've got 40 patents and, you know, graduated to Kamlu, you're very smart. I'm just thinking, like, oh my God, my mind will just blow, you know, <laughs> mind blowing to work with all these amazing, brilliant people and having to bring. And I think, you know, with innovation, you have people that are doing different things. And we, we tend to be like people who work with ideas, we become very married to it. And I can imagine the, the conversations that you have with the researchers, um, you know, and also going to the guys who understand the product and the market, how that can actually be, you know, challenging mm -hmm. for you. Um, so my question for you would be then, share, can you share for me an insight into memory-driven computing and its potential impact on future technological advancements? Sure. And so this is a, this is an idea. That it's one of these things that it starts it starts in the hallway or maybe, you know, for me, this is probably about 2006, 2008. We had been working on a new new category of computing infrastructure called blade surfers. And and it was bringing in some great ideas. It was it was everything that we were designing for that initial wave of Internet and mobile computing build out. And we had, yeah. yeah, I remember I was, I was sitting back in 1999, I was sitting in the back mm -hmm. of a conference room at America Online, and mm -hmm. we had just met this whole new category of customers called an internet service provider. Uh, and yeah. everything we were doing in computing was always about how do I deliver great outcomes to a, a CIO and an enterprise? 
uh, you know, it's all about database. It's all about information processing for business. Here's this new category of customer, this internet service provider, who suddenly yeah. provided information to every single one of us. And back then, of course, it was dial-up, but pretty soon it was on mobile devices yeah. and on laptops yeah. and, and everything. And so we we took all of, they had just different I, different needs, different constraints. They had to have things that that came on, plugged in, turned on as quick as we could build the computing. They need to have mm -hmm. it in production, delivering those great very first wave of internet experiences. So we turned those yeah. ideas and those constraints into a new class of system. And it's one of the things we we did it. And and back in 2006, we came out with a, with a product that really just knocked the socks off of that particular challenge. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. one of these things where you accomplish something. And at that point, you know, from 2000, from 1999 to 2006, I'm already seven years into these ideas. Uh, and so sometimes yeah. you have to just remind yourself, sometimes it takes time. It takes time for the ideas to mature and the market to mature. We did that and it, and it was a fantastic product launch. Um, it's one of the things where you sit back and say, wow, it doesn't get better than this, does it? And then you remind yourself of yeah. the year, it has to get better than this. So what is that next challenge? And so for us, it was looking at all the technologies that we had just pulled together to satisfy mm -hmm. this new emerging need and then you want to you wonder what's coming next. And for us, it was it was a variety of forces that were coming together. We saw that mm. that tailwind we'd all been used to, which was Moore's law. We all draw our nice exponential increase of graph every other yeah. year. Things are twice as good as they were before, uh, uh, and all that was based in semiconductors. But yeah. you know that curve was starting to flatten out. So we thought about that. We thought about all of the economic and technology intersections about everything that made us so successful. And it's one of the important questions that you have to ask yourself as a technologist. Uh, I have a window, I'm, I'm, I'm solving a problem using the technologies I have at hand. What windows are opening up? What new things are coming? Because yeah. my ingenuity opens up a window of opportunity for a business, someone else's mm. ingenuity can just as quickly close that. So part of what yes. we were doing then was thinking, what would close the window? What would would end the chapter of the kind of computing that we were doing? And that led us to uh, imagine what was coming next. What was coming next was a change in some of those basic approaches. You know, it used to be yeah. memory scarce. We always asked for more memory in our laptops. Well, what if novel mm. memory technologies came and they changed that equation? So it's what was used to be scarce was abundant. We're all used to, everything was about programming. Well, what if it wasn't about programming anymore? What if it was about mm -hmm. data? And what if it was about training instead of programming? So with us already thinking about what we imagine today is all about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is all about the data and extracting insight from it and then turning that insight into action. So it mm -hmm. was a program, a research program we started, you know, and that was me jumping over to the labs team in 2014. Yeah to say what is coming next. And that was for us to understand, we called it memory-driven computing because we wanted yeah. to incorporate and understand that we're having a shift. It used to be about just how many microprocessor cores I could fit of an industry standard architecture into one chip. And then I would create a couple of those, I'd pull those, that, that whole internet scale build out. You think about that data center, row after row of identical boxes. And we began to begin re-architect from the basic computer science up and imagining what would it be like here, you know, in the mid 2020s, uh, and that's really what mm -hmm. we started doing, you know. And, and now it's a decade. I've been at Hewlett Packard Labs for a decade. Now mm -hmm. a lot of those ideas are starting to come to fruition, and of course we're already mm -hmm. looking over into thinking what's coming next. Uh, and so for us, it's is to continuously evaluate that technology, yes. those technologies that we have right now. What are those emerging technologies that have an opportunity? Uh, to to close the conventional wisdom and close it down and open up that next yeah. set of opportunities. And that's the process of continuous reinvention, reinvigoration re, uh, uh, that is part of what we find is so valuable for us at Hewlett Packard Labs to deliver to our business, to our customers, our team members yeah. and partners is always being willing to 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 defy convention, to be a little bit contrarian, mm -hmm. I know we've been fantastically successful at these technologies. I know that that uh, we there's that everyone will just say, "Oh, of course we're going to do it this way." But what yes. if we didn't? 
And I think that's part of my, again, part of my job on a daily basis is to find and connect researchers who are always asking new and different questions, connect them to the real world problems people have today, and then see, is there a business opportunity? Wow. I mean, that's fascinating because it means that you need to have the foresight, right, of what's going to to um, to happen in the future. Um, and as you're talking, I'm just curious. I mean, have you ever got it wrong? Like, you know, and, and was, <laughs> I ever thought, you know what, this is the next thing that's going to happen. And then it doesn't. And you've already invested like the time from your researchers to your team. Have you ever got it wrong? And how do you deal with, you know, that kind of failure? Like if you, yeah. you get there, like how do you deal with it. And and it's and one of the things I always tell some young technologists, uh, when you look back yeah. on your career, you're going to look back about what you got wrong. And you're going to laugh yeah. at yourself, or at least you have to be able to laugh <laughs> at yourself. Yes. The hard part is when you look back and you got it right. You know, you'll laugh when mm -hmm. you got it wrong. You might cry when you got it right because you might have had the technology call was right. But yes. just that aha moment, that realization of the possible that the light bulb goes off, that's only the first step. You know, you definitely, that is necessary step. You have to have that ingenuity. But ingenuity mm. alone is not enough to make a difference in the world. You need to have yes. that ingenuity, and then you need to find opportunity. What is that yeah. problem that needs to be solved? And the hard part is it might not even be something that people can articulate. They just know mm. that they 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 aren't happy with what they have. They want to do more. They just don't know how. So yeah. that first step for a technologist is to find that opportunity, and that means you have to have a community. Uh, it's, yeah. it's unlikely uh, that you're going to figure this out on your own. So the first thing for mm -hmm. me, like when we were doing the the first the blade systems and then the memory driven computing, you pop your head over the cube ball and you ask the person who's over there, uh, "Am I crazy or is this a thing? Yeah. Is this an idea that actually has merit?" And hopefully, you're not just popping over the cube ball to talk to the next engineer who's mm -hmm. in the cubicle next to you. Maybe you go over an aisle. You talk to someone yeah. who's in the marketing team. You talk to some. Of, you talk to your field technologists who actually have to make the things that you created work in the real world. You talk to mm. partners. You talk to customers. You gain that community, and then you—that's mm. how you identify opportunity. But even then, yeah. even with ingenuity and opportunity, you still need one more piece, and that's investment, right? You need to yeah. get to resources to realize that potential, and that means that you need to be able to talk to people who have resources. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that's where, again, the network has to be there. You have to have access and, and acumen. And, and by that, I mean, you have to be able to, to have a conversation. I uh, have to be willing to have a conversation to put yourself out there to talk to a business yeah. lead. Uh, and then you also need to bridge the gap. If the only thing you yeah. talk is geek speak and, uh, and that's all they're going to hear, then they're just going to hear blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You yeah. have to be able to. And so that means you, you might need a coach. You might need a mentor. You might need a partner in this mm. conversation to articulate how your ingenuity and that business opportunity can meet. And then you have to be able to, 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 to say what it's going to take. Finite wow. resources, finite time, not without risk, because mm. if there was no risk, there would be no upside reward, but being able to talk to that. So I think for me, that's that that element. And, you know, I've had failures where I have made the technology guess wrong. Uh, and sometimes yeah. that's because it looks great in the lab. And then when we mm -hmm. try to ramp it up, uh, there's something. There's something that keeps it from production, that keeps it from, from actually working in the real world. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a failure not of technology, but of time. You know, that yeah. here's a great technology and you have it, but there's something about the business process. Okay. That yeah. The world's not ready for this. There's yeah. there's a there's a political, uh, a technical, uh, political or uh, regulatory or just a, an acceptance uh, that is uh, not there yet. And it can be yeah. one of the hardest things you're going to have as a technologist, as an innovator, is when you pick up the newspaper and you see someone else who just got an IPO or a product launch, you thought, I yeah. had that same idea 10 years ago. You know, oh, part yeah. of that is to say, it, so it's your idea and someone else's logo, someone else's name is on the check. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's where I think you have to be introspective and say, okay, what did I miss out? Was I, did I miss out on the understanding the business opportunity? Did I miss out in how I presented it to, to try and gain that investment? Or, or sometimes, you know, it's, you're just too soon. And then yes. you have to think about that. And I guess one of the things that's, that, that we, we always stress here at Hewlett Packard Labs, we start a project uh, mm -hmm. and we start those investigations. But, you know, if it's, if it's closer than two or three years to the opportunity, then we yeah. might need to, if we can't transfer that into a business, if we can't transfer that to a partner, if we can't transfer it to an open source community, then mm -hmm. you got to put it on the shelf. Uh, because, you yeah. know, you can only do that initial investigation and development so far, and then yes. it, needs to, it either needs to flourish because its time is right, or yeah. you know, sometimes the seed doesn't always fire, fall on the right ground, uh, and that, yeah. or at the right season, we just have to accept that, take a little break, uh, yeah. <laughs> have a little, have a little cry. And then yeah. on to the next opportunity, uh, because you can continue to drive. And also, and oh, drive. have a little cocktail in between. <laughs> there you go, or some coffee. <laughs> but that can be tough. It can be tough to let it go. It can be tough to realize that uh, that's, that someone else's idea is now better. Uh, and, you, you know, you were the best until someone else had their aha moment. Someone else found the opportunity. Someone else is satisfying the opportunity better, or maybe they had the better investment. And so sometimes you just have to have to let it go and think, okay, always we What's begin it? again. What is that yeah. next opportunity for me? Just listening to you. I mean, there's been obviously you've 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 done a lot and been with the company for so long. You understand it and you, you know, you've dealt with a lot, and I can imagine. Um, with over 40 patents, though, you know, like uh uh, behind your name, which invention or discovery are you most proud of and why? You know, it, it's interesting. So, uh, and I even have one. Oh, here's one right here. You know, every time you get a patent, you get a little plaque, right? <laughs> and so, oh, nice. <laughs> said, I got I got a lot of these that are that are sitting around the house uh, uh, and in my mm -hmm. office at Hewlett Packard Labs. Um, and it's interesting because you you get that you get that patent because you had yeah. that moment you were able to document it you were able to convince someone at the patent office the patent examiner that okay this really did advance the state of the art but mm. you know back to that question of ingenuity and so I have you know, I have the plaques that I've had those aha moments um, yes. but for it to really make a difference. You know, you have to have that, all those things come together. You have to have the ingenuity, the opportunity, you find that investment. I think looking back on my patent portfolio, um, you know, there are some that are that are, are very dear to me, like the ones that we're about, sitting in the back yeah. of that conference room at AOL, listening to all of the complaints and challenges, all the things they didn't like about our products. They wanted one piece and they hated the rest of it. And some of the patents yeah. are all about solving that set of constraints. So I'm proud about those ones because they actually did start off what ended up being, you know, a multi-billion dollar segment of the computing industry. Um, so that's, yeah. that's rewarding. Um, but, you know, the ones that I, I'm actually most excited about right now were some of the very first patents I got uh, at mm -hmm. HP. Um, and yeah. they were all around understanding how we uh, equate energy inputs to business outputs. Uh, and yeah. uh, this is, you know, this is, these were, I think I filed them and filed them back there in, in the late 1990s, uh, you yeah. know, some of my very first patent applications, early 2000s, uh, uh -huh. you know, if, for those who don't know here in the U.S., you you file a patent application, and sometimes I think my fastest was three years, the longest was nine years between oh, filing, wow. filing the application and getting the plaque on the wall. Um, yeah, but I had this whole set of of applications all around this energy to business outcomes and how we can tailor the information technology energy footprint and consumption to match that to really allow someone mm -hmm. to to be thoughtful about how energy uh, equates to to the business outcomes, and those all stayed as plaques on the wall because yeah. back in the early two thousands. When I wanted to have a conversation about what we now call sustainability, uh, it's like, yeah. okay, well, you know what? There was never enough people in the same room. 
One yeah, person yeah, yeah. that I'm just delivering power to the data center. Another person, I just run yeah. the data center floor. Another person, I just write the application. Another person, I just yeah. manage the infrastructure. The other person, I'm just the I just care about the business output. Uh, and all of those uh, were sometimes, you know, in different companies, let alone yeah. different departments. So we never had everyone come together. And mm. it was so frustrating to me because, you know, one of the things I've always prided myself on, I think I got this from my dad, is that yeah. understanding of engineering is about efficiency and stewardship yeah. of resources and how are we doing the best possible work and be able to have that be demonstrable to be transparent about how we consume resources to achieve outcomes mm -hmm. and be thoughtful mm -hmm. and responsible about our design and i thought why can't why doesn't anyone care and it wasn't that they <laughs> didn't care is that they were all driven by a different set of business objectives yes and so that was you know over the last you know really well, maybe climate years. change was not a big issue then we didn't think you know and, we were so, doing yeah. and so wrong. it was it was not yeah. a part of the conference i couldn't ever get anyone enough people, critical mass, interested to see, okay, this is actually a business opportunity. This is where I should invest. And you go back to those second pieces of that equation. But yeah. in the last 18 months, I've had more substantive conversations about sustainability than I had in the last 18 years. And so yes. now finally, it seems when that we can we can have that big meeting. We can have that big yeah. conversation. And even if it is a half a dozen different companies, mm. we all have a single goal now. And that's how does the enterprise achieve its sustainability goals? How do we have yeah. that complicated conversation? And so now we're, we're we're pulling out some of that work, and it's not just myself; yeah. it's 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 uh, hundreds of technologists I know here at at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, both in the labs teams as well as our product teams, and we're all saying, finally, they're putting us in. Yeah. We're ready. We're ready to take on this challenge, and we have that depth of knowledge, but. Of course, now what's also so exciting is not just what we thought about 20 years ago. It's now bringing yeah. the full weight and capability of AI-driven solutions into the Please. equation. Because wow. part of what we found is that we need to have superhuman levels of optimization yeah. and efficiency. That's what AI could bring to us. Uh, and so yeah. so it's, it's part of it is just finally seeing that the season has come for sustainable yeah. and responsible design technologies. And now we're able to have something that's going to extend beyond human capabilities uh, mm. to, uh, to have artificial intelligence augmentation of these systems so we can actually run them at superhuman levels of efficiency to provide that transparency. So hopefully, you know, this is where everyone's going to buy in uh, to mm. sustainable solutions and really enable us to live within our means and to be thinking about our children and our children's children and how we're yeah. going to enable them to have a better world. Wow. No, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you actually mentioned AI because that's that would have been my next question <laughs> about <laughs> how do you see the role of, a of ethics in AI um, and AI development and what steps is HPE taking to ensure ethical considerations yep. um, are at the forefront? And and when we're talking about you know sustainability being such an important you know um, aspect of your work and a lot of the innovation that you've done, I read an article um, uh, I think it was two weeks ago or or, or less um, from um, the Wall Street Journal, and they were saying that ESG now has become one of the swear words you know in business that people are not so. I was like okay. You know, because this is something that just came up now. Like, what does it, I mean, are you seeing that in, in everything that you're doing in terms of other organizations that you, you, you're you working with? Um, Yeah, those are basically the, yeah. the two questions, I suppose. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of back in there. So but let's, let's talk about, yeah. let's talk about, um, I talk about the, the responsible AI ethics uh, work that we've been done. And it's interesting for me because, you know, again, part of, we were having, we're having, we'll call it, um, academic conversations in the hallways, really going back 10 years about, about responsible ethical design. Um, but it was, they were just those, they were conversations. They were, it, they were labs conversations about these. And we're dreaming about artificial consciousness and what is the role of, what do we owe if we were to be able to create an artificial consciousness? Uh, what would we owe it in terms of responsible ethical treatment? We think of responsible ethical treatment of, of animals. And we said, well, is yeah. that the model we have? We think of the responsible ethical treatment we have for each other. Is that the model? Very interesting, philosophical 
conversations. Yeah. What happened that made it different for us was we had our we have our global human rights uh, uh, organization, part of our global ethics and compliance office. And back in 1990, I'm sorry, back in 2019, they, com yes. they commissioned an external audit of our entire human rights position. Uh, and you think about a global company like ours, you ask yourself all about the supply chain. Are we dealing with, are we only uh, sourcing conflict-free minerals and materials into our supply chain? Are we yes. constantly vigilant to make sure that there's no forced or enslaved labor in our supply chain? And, yeah. you know, we have taken great strides and really this is work that's gone back over two decades about not only yes. setting up the bar for our own industry, but really across industries. And we got that, the, the, external, the external auditor said, Congratulations, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. You are continuing to maintain your leadership here, but we got three things that you need to worry about in the future for your human rights position: yeah. AI, AI, and AI. AI in your <laughs> products, AI in yes. your processes, and when people build uh, AI-driven outcomes on top of your goods and services. And that mm -hmm. was the message that came to our comp global compliance and, and human rights team. Mm -hmm. So they picked up the phone and they say, hey, Hewlett Packard Labs, uh, we'd like to have a conversation. And so that really kicked off because they knew how to establish governance processes, our ESG, our uh, DEI, all of those programs in Hewlett Packard Enterprise that are industry leading, they know how to run those. What they didn't understand was AI technology. So we partnered. Mm -hmm. So our, our AR, the head of our AI research lab, one of my fellow fellows here at Lab, Paolo Ferabowski, he partnered with our global um, chief global compliance officer to set up our responsible AI ethics governance process. I partnered yeah. with our chief human rights and chief privacy officers, and we started out to say, okay, we need AI ethics principles that are authentic to Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And we had an advantage. Yeah not only because we had a world leading global ethics and compliance office who could tell us how to actually run a program like this, is yeah. we started out with a blank page. And at the very top, I wrote our purpose. And if you meet our mm -hmm. CEO, Antonio Neri, and you spend more than five minutes with him, he'll probably remind you as he does all of us, our purpose is to advance the way people live and work. That, yeah. We put that at the top of the blank sheet. And from that, we then came up with five principles uh, about a how AI at Hewlett Packard Enterprise should be. AI should be privacy privacy preserving and secure. AI should be human focused. AI it should is. be inclusive. And those were the yeah. ones that came from the from the side of the com global compliance and human rights team. And then we had the engineering driven ones. AI should be responsible. AI should mm -hmm. be robust. And we went down and and we wrote a definition for each one of those things. I was the I led the team that wrote those principles. I originally yes. gave us six weeks to write it all down. It took us a year. Wow. We argued about Ooh. every single word on that page, but I think That's it was super much. important <laughs> for us to get through that yeah. whole process. And so that yeah. was that was 2019. From 2019 mm -hmm. to now, what we've been learning is how do we live up to those principles? Yes. It's one thing to claim you have principles. It's another thing yeah. to have them be evidenced in the way that you live your life. Uh, and yeah. how you run your business. And that's really what we've been doing since then is learning how how do we provide that guidance when I want to incorporate AI into a, make a better Hewlett Packard Enterprise product, what do, how do I how do I uphold those principles? When I want to create a great AI driven process, whether it's one of our human resources teams, one of our marketing teams, how do we interpret yeah. all those? And then finally, when people come to us and say, I love your compute, I love your networking. I love your storage. Yeah. I love all the software you have here. I want to drive this AI-driven outcome. How do we provide guidance to our field team, to our sales teams, so that we know that we are always upholding these principles? Now, the other piece yeah. about that, when we fall short, when we see a problem with conventional mm -hmm. AI technologies yeah. doesn't allow us to meet our ethics and responsible guidelines and principles with confidence, then actually that becomes a Hewlett Packard Labs research problem because oh, we're wow. saying, okay, we want to solve the problem. We want to use AI. Here's the 10 reasons why conventional AI solutions don't allow me to do this with confidence. What alternative ways can we solve a problem? What are those new ways? That's where we bring in those research teams. And of course, it's not mm -hmm. just our research team, it's that global 
community, especially because we want to understand how we source AI-driven solutions that really affirm individual local uh, behaviors, customs, laws, and communities. So that's where it's, it's not just a one-size-fits-all. It's adapting and enabling people to create AI-driven solutions that are really supportive of their, their culture and their values. And then oh, wow. it, that's that's sometimes that's not just about policy. It's not just about implementation. It's not just about, it's sometimes it's the technology needs to change because, yes. it, you know, that's not, it's not just, it's not just a compliance question. It's also those technology principles that we're trying to uphold as well. Oh, wow. I mean, you mentioned um, DEI, obviously as a black woman, you know, and who is still a minority in tech and still trying, you know, still very difficult for black women to, you know, to to get opportunities. Um, you know, I've been reading a lot and, and just seeing what is happening in the United States right now about, you know, the sort of backlash against um, from affirmative action to DI. I, I saw a tweet, for example, from Elon Musk says another racism or whatever. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, are you feeling that, um, you know, from HP perspective um, that you feel like you need to change? Because I think when, when we look at the issue of diversity and inclusion, especially including in inclusion of black people and black women in tech, mm -hmm. there's still a, literally a minority. I mean, like just a few years ago, I haven't seen the latest test, but like Silicon Valley, like for example, Facebook, uh, black employees were like at 2%, right? And Google was also at a negligible number, also less than like double digits. And when you, see, when you hear this conversation about, oh, we shouldn't have this, you should not have that. Why are you including race? Why are you including that when we are actually, people are still excluded? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you see from, from that perspective? Because obviously the people who are vocal are the people who are likely to buy your products because unfortunately, as you know, the, the people who are not included don't have the buying power. Um, do you see that affecting, because at the end of the day, you are a business. Do you stick with? I do you foresee that you're gonna stick with it, or you're gonna go? You know what? If the world says we don't, if you know the majority of our customers says we don't need to do this, then so be it. Yeah, you know one of the things that I do love about this company is I get to travel the world, and yeah. I have met people all over the world who are leaders in technology in their own communities in their own countries. And you, I'm amazed at how many people say, you know, uh, the reason I'm in technology is back 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, you know, yeah. someone in my family got their first job in technology because they were helping service Hewlett Packard equipment in my country and mm. brought us in. You, you, They got training. They got that initial uh, understanding of the technology, and because we we needed to source and bring in that combination of local understanding and competency, and give them the access to the understanding of the technology, it started people mm -hmm. off on a process. And I've, it's been amazing to me to how many people I've met around the world who you know they 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 started them they they're on a course of technology because. Someone. It was their. It was their grandmother. It was their uncle. Yeah. It was their auntie. They. There was just someone in their past who were given the opportunity to not just consume technology, but take that yeah. first step to understand technology, to help service and support technology, and then the next step. Okay. Well, now I understand how to support it. Can I help be on the supply side? Can I either deliver or adapt? Or maybe I'm going from technician and now I'm gonna I'm gonna be a, a partner with you and I can help deliver your technology. And then, you know, can I strike that next step and start deliver, you know, delivering on the supply side of technology? So I think I've been very proud of, of our company and on uh, in the history and legacy we have around the world about introducing technology into communities and getting people onto the supply side of technology, yeah. not just the consumption side. But I also yeah. think that you know, to your point right now, uh, I guess I, I am always of the economic argument. Why would I not avail myself of talent? Especially when now we need to have that understanding. You know, if I want to know what a uh, an old white guy from Silicon Valley thinks, I can just listen to my own thoughts, right? That's not yeah. gonna solve 
the opportunities globally. We are a global company. We need to have that global perspective, especially now mm -hmm. when it is all about understanding how we adapt technology to the, the local conditions, because it's not just about what fits in the in the data center in here in, in North America anymore. It's understanding how we get these technologies out globally, out to every every everyone's in their pocket, in their house, in their office and adapting that. And I can I can suppose and I can imagine and I'm going to be wrong about what yeah. the actual conditions are, what the potential is, what the opportunities are. You know, back to that question of do I understand the opportunities? You know, engineers love boundary conditions. That's how you turn yeah. something from the theoretical into the practical. That's that's you apply the boundary conditions to a to the equation and you end up with with the actual outcome. For me, the, we just need to constantly remind ourselves we only know so much. We need to have that diverse un yeah. understanding, that diverse talent, that experience and localization. All of those just create so much more opportunity than if we just stamp out one solution and say, take it or leave it. You know, it, yeah. you know, it looks a lot like me. Uh, isn't that yeah. good enough? And the answer is no, you it's not. It. Yeah. It's not good enough, yeah. and and people deserve more. They deserve better. They deserve to see themselves mm -hmm. in the products that they consume, uh, and that means to to try and understand what does it take to get more people on the supply side of these equations, and to be able to adapt and localize, and then extend and have their own capabilities and culture reflected in the products that they're going to use on a daily basis. Because that's again back to that question of stewardship, uh, and yeah. uh, and adapting and fitness for purpose. If we yes. don't understand it, then there's always going to be a, a miss. There's always going to be something that's inefficient about that process because it's yeah. not going to be how people live and work exactly where we are. And again, that's our purpose is to not just advance the way people live and work to make them look yeah. and live and work the way I do. It's the, it's the way that they want to live and they want yeah. to work. And that's where yeah. that, I mean, those voices have to come in. Yeah. Don't tell me what I need. Ask me what I need. Right. Ask me what I want. Tell yeah. Me, oh, ask, yeah, ask me what I want. So um, in your view, what are the biggest challenges um, and, and opportunities that are facing the tech industry um, that you think or, you know, the tech industry would, would be facing over the next um, decade? I mean, I think there's been a talk about AI, but, you know, it's been it hasn't, um, you know, until chat GPT. No, AI was this that was still coming, right? Until the ChatGPT came, and and everybody now there's no company that is not building a AI, you know, powered system or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, then obviously when Mark Zuckerberg was driving the metaverse at that time, you know, they, it, it it wasn't as successful. And now you know with Apple, we, you know, given that how good they are in getting people to adopt technology. So I think it will be probably, they've got a chance to succeed now, right? But um, what do you see, you know, from, you know, because your work has been to look ahead and you talked about how sometimes you you got it wrong. So now <laughs> I'm gonna ask you, and so that I can come back, you know, maybe in five years and say, Kirk, remember you said, <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, you were right. Oh, you got this wrong. <laughs> Yeah. So I think uh, for me, the, the number one question is going to be around sustainability. We've demonstrated these amazing technologies. They are just this short of science fiction, right? Uh, the fact that we're having this conversation right now, right? Unimaginable just a short time ago. The fact that we could have a live transcription translated into multiple languages as we were speaking, you know, that was science fiction. But all those things are possible now. The question, though, We've done it for the first, you know, however many, maybe one one billion people. Well, there's yeah. there's eight billion people, right? And so, yeah. on all these technologies, is it something that we can scale? Is it something where we can we can take that that lesson from the categorical imperative? If we're to afford everyone equal access to these technologies, would we be able yeah. to afford it? And I think for me, well, if something yeah. is unsustainable, it's inherently equ inequitable because we can't afford the benefits to everyone. So I think solving for 8 billion, that for me, in everything we do, are we solving for 8 billion? Are we solving for the, the food, the water, 
the education, the healthcare, and the opportunity mm -hmm. that fits that befits eight billion individuals and yeah. befits their individual human dignity. If the answer is no, it can't scale, then yes. you know that's the question. Then that's that can be it can be a bit of a technology problem. It can be I'm sorry, it can be a little bit of a policy problem, but it yes. can also be a technology problem. If I can't yeah. afford to afford this to everyone, then, mm. then we have to take stock. We have to ask ourselves, what is what is the other way? Is this a real technology opportunity? And when you think about all those large language models that we're creating right now, and we say, well, that's fantastic. It's like, yeah, but you know, those models incredibly consumptive of our semiconductor resources, of our energy resources. They're also consuming literally every single bite we've ever recorded as a species and put it up there with perhaps turning a blind eye to IP uh, and equitable rewarding the people who created that information in the and, first And place. also they exclude a lot of people. I mean, like exactly. I wanted to you want to put chat GPT and you say who was the 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 first king of the Swazi people, it it basically tells you rubbish. And you know, <laughs> and so that's, that's with my our fear. culture in South Africa with eleven uh, official languages um, and different cultures, it gets it gets it wrong. So I know that hopefully, yeah. if somebody needs to build that for Africans, they're gonna have to because a lot of what data that is there, it it excludes us. You know, I can't. My kids can't learn about the African culture on Chat GPT because it's not there, right? And that's yeah. There's a huge concern for me. Is that is that's monoculture? Right. That is yeah. saying that, oh, because the capital and operational cost to train a model is so insanely high, there's only a couple mm. companies or multinational regions that can afford to do that. Well, then that's established a gatekeeper, because I do believe this is the way that we will all be doing these kinds of knowledge work. That, mm. that creates a huge concern for me. What if the yes. only way to write a, a piece of business text is to have it sound like you grew up in Northern California in the Silicon Valley because yeah. that's who had access to training the model. That is not a world in which I want to see all of that culture squash because there's a new gatekeeper in there. So again, that's the question. How sustainably and equitably can I provide access to the creation of these mm. large language models? And if it's wow. so capital and operationally intensive that only one of three megacorps can can generate the model, well, then that's yeah. a technology problem because we need yeah. to have a different way in which the models are created, a novel technology element, a, uh, some, uh, some policy elements. That's what has to come together. So again, for me, that's always going to come back. How do we understand the energy implications of all these systems? Because that ends up being... The sustainability. You add the energy equation. You add in the material supply chain of the equation. Where are all those minerals coming from? Because you know every supply chain ends in either the sun, where we get our energy, or the yeah. or former suns, if it's uh, if the light of former suns, or it is mined out of the earth. Uh, well, right yeah. now, those are our only two sources. The problem with mining out of the earth is it's also where we have to live. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> what are those? How are we sustaining? Sustaining the planet, all those stuff. So, for me, sustainability and the ability to scale to 8 billion or send people. people to Mars, like uh, Elon Musk is trying to. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, there is, we can, we can talk about the ethics of space. Again, my dad was an aerospace yeah. engineer, so it's, it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I think yeah. that we have to be realistic, though. There's only one yeah. place in the universe we know that can support human life for sure. Yeah. And that yeah. is the one that we're on right now. And yes. understanding how we nurture and support that so that we can continue to have, again, back to thinking about all those eight, 8 billion people, but thinking of them as individuals and yes. what is their individual human dignity. I guess for me, that's the real question of engineering scaling. Can I solve for 8 billion equitably yeah. and sustainably all of our technological inventions, all of these capabilities? It has to come back for solving for the human. Yeah. Well, no, thank you so much. I mean, like, it's really amazing to see somebody at your, at your level sometimes thinking of those things because, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's not it's not as, as universal as you hope it would be. My final question for you, um, this is cocktail and blurbs, after all, <laughs> even though it's early for you to have a cocktail, 
But I'm going to ask you, if you were to create a cocktail, right? This is a question I ask all my guests. Mm -hmm. That represents your work, right? Um, or um, or the future, as you, you were talking about, you, you're passionate so, so much about sustainability. What would be in, what ingredients would be in it and why? Yeah, so uh, I do, I do, I do love myself a cocktail. <laughs> And uh, these <laughs> days, uh, I'm I'm in two minds. Uh, you know, if I was to make a cocktail right now, I might just go back in my backyard where I have my grapefruit trees are are just nice. just about right right now. Uh, so I wow. might grab one of those grapefruits. Uh, I also have. Uh, I last year uh, I made uh, a um, uh, a popomel cello, uh, you know, the 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 grapefruit based uh, um, uh, liqueur. So grapefruit juice. Grapefruit liqueur, uh, some a nice gin, uh, and uh, a little bit of Peshaw bitters, uh, you know, the flavor of New Orleans. Uh, I that for me, that is one of my favorite cocktails uh, right now. Unless wow. I want to go the whiskey route, because I also uh, I enjoy I enjoy very <laughs> peaty, very smoky whiskeys, and so those smoke flavored uh, smoke flavored cocktails. Uh, I'm, I'm a cognac person, so yeah. I don't like whiskey that much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for me, it's it's always going to be it's going to be a mixture, and it's going to be some strong flavor components. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I I like the smoke. I like I like the bitter. I like the I like the sour. Uh, not so much sweet. Maybe a hint of sweetness just to round things out. Uh, but that's what I really enjoy uh, in a cocktail. Are those uh, I like bold flavors. Uh, I, yeah, that's what that's that's my go-to. Now, no, I'm looking forward to sharing one with you. Hopefully, when I come to Silicon Valley, we can have one. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know how I've been just trying to talk to you. One of the most inspirational people I met. Remember, you were talking to somebody else at the table. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, I have to talk to this guy. Um, and I'm just so excited that, you know, we finally got the chance and got people to really get to see, to hear you and 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 like hear your heart and hopefully inspires many other leaders um, to really, you know, think about that it's not just about the technology is, you know, and think about the people, everybody else, right? It's not just those who have, because, you know, we have to look at how do we create a just and equitable world. And by that is by making sure that, you know, we bring people up, you know, how do we send down the, the ladder? And it's such a breath of fresh air when you have somebody who's leading innovation in thinking about those people. Because, you know, sometimes they don't have the buying power. So, you know, so thank you so much. And thank you for your time. And thank you for being you. Um, I'm so inspired by you. Oh, I've loved the conversation. And yes, next time we are, whether it's in uh, it's in Dubai or here in Silicon Valley, hopefully we'll be able to, to, to enjoy that cocktail. Or maybe Davos or Geneva. Either yes. way, we're <laughs> going to meet when I have a cocktail. <laughs> So um, thank you so much and I hope you have a great day. You too. Bye.